Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, we uh, celebrate this uh, tomorrow is Independence Day, and we uh, celebrate uh, the founding of our country um, on Christian principles, um, the Puritans leaving England, many of them coming to a land that was very harsh, very hard for them, and yet they endured to leave persecution so that, might, so that they might worship their God uh, in a way without being told how to worship or who to worship. And so uh, our nation has been in existence uh, over 200 years now, and uh, we enjoy the freedoms from all the hard work, the labor, the sweat, and sometimes even people's lives that have guaranteed uh, our freedom to come and to worship and to celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? And we give thanks for that. If you would stand with me this morning, if you're visiting with us, uh, I just uh, ask you to note there's a card in front of you. Uh, it's a visitor's card. If you would be so kind as to fill that out, we'd just like to send you a letter uh, and send you some resources that hopefully will be a blessing to you. And now let's open our time in prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning. Your Spirit is our teacher. And so, Father, we pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word. And Lord, we've gathered together as your people to come and to bring you our worship, our praise. And Father, we pray that you truly are worshiped in spirit and truth as you require. And Father, we pray that as we've gathered together, we've not come to pretend that our lives are easy or that, Lord, we have everything uh, down pat because we follow you. But Lord, we struggle. We're full of sin. Our hearts deceive us. We're no different uh, than any other person in the world. And so I pray, Father, may we come humbly before your throne today, realizing that you have chosen us before the foundation of the world. It's only by your sovereign grace that we can be here, a redeemed people. And Father, as we celebrate communion this morning, may we remember the price that was paid for our sin. May we never take it for granted. And Lord, tomorrow as we go to celebrate Independence Day, the founding of this nation, that we enjoy so many freedoms in. Lord, may we lift our voices in praise even more. Lord, for how you've done a mighty work here. This nation is not perfect and even in recent days seems to be turning away from you. But Lord, may we be people who are on our knees coming before you as our forefathers to pray for this nation to be a nation that follows the creator God, the redeemer of all people, the saviors, the savior of our souls. And Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified in our service this morning. Bless our fellowship. Bless our worship. To you we give all the praise. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. And with that, remain standing for the reading of God's word. Good morning. Scripture reading is 1 Peter 5, 6-11. If you want to follow along as I read. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. <clears throat> Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now we're talking, so there, get her going. So, all right, well, thank you. It's good to have an opportunity to be here and to speak and to teach God's word. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am an elder at Maranatha Bible Church uh, in Comstock Park, Michigan. I've been going there for 
well over 20 years now, um, so it's been a blessing to be there. Uh, my background is I grew up in the great state of Ohio. Uh, yes, God loves Michigan fans, so just so you know, uh, but grew up there and uh, was uh, actively engaged in the church there, especially my teenage years. I went to Word Life Bible Institute for a year, ended up graduating from uh, Cedarville, Uni well, back in my day, it was Cedarville College, it's now Cedarville University. Got my master's degree in theology from Grace Theological Seminary. Uh, served in youth as well as pastoral work, as well as church planning. And then God kind of had a switch in my career where I am now a CPA. Had my own tax and accounting practice here in Grand Rapids for many years, and that has been going really well. So it's just a slight change for me, but it's been great to be involved within a local church and serving and working there in that capacity. I am have, I have married, wife uh, of 40 years back in June now, so Gloria and I have been married for that long. She has survived me, uh, <laughs> and, then, uh, uh, and then I have two kids and also four grandchildren. So kind of the running joke in our household is, you know, my, you know, for me, I have a lot of education, as you, could, as you heard. I had two master's degrees, and my wife, by contrast, has a high school diploma. It works, you know, but uh, it's kind of funny. The joke in our family is, is that I have the educational training. She has all of the common sense, and unfortunately, that's more true than what I'd like to admit. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's uh, the way it is for us. So today, we're going to be looking at a text in the Gospel of Matthew. So locate with me in your copy of God's Word. Matthew chapter 17. And while you're turning there, I'd like to tell you a story about Elisa Bonaparte. You probably heard, you know, probably know of her more famous brother, Napoleon Bonaparte. But nevertheless, Elisa was on her deathbed. Things were not going well. And there was a person within the room that said these words to her, trying to comfort her, but I'm not too sure he accomplished that when he said, Elisa, nothing in life is certain but death. That would cheer you up, right? And Elisa's reply was, except taxes, making the phrase, nothing in life is certain but death and taxes, traceable at least all the way back to Elisa Bonaparte. You know, April 15th is not a good day for us in America. You know what that day is? Everybody seems to recognize it. It is tax day. Taxes are due. And I've seen it over the years. People run around. They try to get everything together. They wait to the last minute. And then hopefully they get the return filed on time hopefully. <laughs> but nevertheless, they only have one of two reactions. They, boy, I'm ready to get my refund. And then there's others that will say, boy, I hope I don't get audited. I mean, after all, the motto of the IRS is this, in God we trust, all others we audit. So you see that we look into the book of Matthew, nothing in life is certain but death and taxes. And you know what? Jesus experienced both. And what we're going to see here in Matthew chapter 17, we're going to see Jesus taking an issue about taxes and teaching something to his disciples and, yes, to us today so that we can learn, grow, and improve within our Christian life and walk. Now, if I were to classify this message, I would say that this is really a basic general message. And what I mean by that, it's a message that contains truths that you should already know that you understand. It's part of the basics, the beginning fundamentals of the Christian life and walk. But it is always important for us to remember what those are because many times we tend to go astray when we miss out on the basics. You know, March is a very bad month for me. Not only is it in the midst of doing taxes, but it is also in the midst of March Madness. I love college basketball. It's just fun. So March Madness and tax season just does not go together, okay? But the crazy thing is, is when you, when you hear a coach and you talk to the coach after the game, their team loses, they always ask a question like this. You know, coach, you lost. What was the problem? What, what happened? What you never hear the coach say is, you know, we had this intricate, in-depth play that was very complicated, that was guaranteed to score every time we would run it correctly, but we just didn't do that difficult play well at all, and because we couldn't run it, we lost the game. They never say that. Rather, they say what? Well, we didn't pass the ball well. We didn't play proper defense. We had too many turnovers. The basics and fundamentals of the game is where we were bad. And that's why we lost. You know what? Within our Christian life and walk, it's literally no different. Because when you falter, when you fall, it's not because of this 
nugget of information is buried deep within the resources of some historical book in the Old Testament that you just didn't put into practice correctly. It's because you have forgotten the basics, the basics that we should all know. So we're going to be reminded of those this morning as we look at the miracle that our Lord did in Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 24. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. Well, when Peter came into the house then, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered, of course. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to them. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake, throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. Now at this juncture in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus had just gotten down from his mountaintop experience with you, Will, back in in verse 1, where he was seen in his glory by all who were around him. It was a magnificent display of God's awesome power and authority. So Jesus now, after going through that experience, now comes down off of that mountain, and it seems like he's immediately once again confronted with the everyday issues of life. And now we have these people who are coming to him, and they're now asking him a question, actually going through Peter first, asking a question about this temple tax. Is Jesus going to pay it? Well, what is being talked about here? And in order to get this, I want you to go back to Exodus chapter 30 with me, okay? So let's turn back to the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 30. And we want to look at this temple tax in verses 12 through 16. Exodus 30. Chat verses 12 through 16. And here it's recorded for us. And beginning in verse, sorry, Exodus 30, beginning in verse uh, 12, yeah, 21, or 11, excuse me. Then the Lord said to Moses, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no plague will come on them when you number them. Each one who crosses over to those already counted is to give a half a shekel according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 garas. This half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. All who cross over, those 20 years old or more, are to give an offering to the Lord. The rich are not to give more than half a shekel, and the poor are not to give less. When you make the offering, Lord, to atone for your lives, receive the money from the Israelites and do what with it? Use it for the service of the tent of meeting. It will be a memorial for the Israelites before the Lord making atonement for your lives. Here was a tax that was imposed by God in order to keep the temple running. It was something that had to be done, and every Israelite, 21 years or older, was supposed to be contributing to this on an annualized basis. It was a requirement. It was something that God imposed. Now, let me step back here for a moment and make a political comment. Am I allowed to do that? Did you notice anything unique here? Because every time I read this, It's very unique to me in verse 15 where it says, The rich are not to give more and the poor are not to give less. Everyone paid the same amount. Now, what I hear all the time is that the rich should pay their fair share. But yet that wasn't what God had in mind here, was it? Regardless of the socioeconomic situation of the person, whether they be rich or they be poor, they were to pay the same amount because it ingrained upon everyone then the importance of the temple. I find that interesting in our modern debate that God had maybe the flat tax in mind a whole lot longer than our politicians. But nevertheless, very interesting that everyone paid the same amount. The temple, it was an expensive thing to run. I mean, you had morning and evening sacrifices, you had incense, you had other things that you had to have it adorned in a certain way. The robe of the high priest alone was a very expensive proposition. It was something that had a lot going on there that took money in order to do. Therefore, this tax was imposed in order to keep the temple running. 
So here we find that when these people come and talk to Peter, the question was, you know, Jesus, he's done a lot of things in his life. You know, he's done some things that are pretty radical. He's been different in a lot of ways. So really, is, is your master Jesus here, Peter, going to pay this tax? I mean, he might be doing something crazy that we're like he's been doing in our minds. And Peter had to then go ask the Lord. So Peter comes in, and he then says, uh, and he then begins to inquire of Jesus, and Jesus starts off by then asking him a question. Basically, the question is going to do this. From the kings of the earth, who do they collect their taxes from? From their relatives or from their non-relatives? And Jesus said, or Peter answered, says, well, of course, they collect it from their non-relatives. Therefore, their relatives, children, are free from paying the tax. Now, this is a kind of a novel concept uh, in, in back, because back in these days, the Roman Empire did not tax their family members, okay? So that, as a result, their family was free from paying the tax. They didn't have to do it. I don't know if you remember many, many, many years ago now, but uh, over in Britain, a castle burned down or had a fire. The British citizens were in an uproar. Because why should our tax dollars pay for this when the royal family doesn't pay taxes? So they had to make a slight change to make the repairs a little bit more palatable to them. But nevertheless, it was the same thing. The royals did not pay tax at that point. And here the whole th situation is, is that no king in the Roman Empire would be taxing their own family. Now, what is Jesus actually doing here? It's kind of interesting when you think about it. Because basically what this is saying is that Jesus is being questioned about whether he was required then to pay that tax. So here's the question we can ask. The temple tax was imposed in Exodus chapter 30. Who imposed the tax? God did. Easy answer. Who owned the temple? God, obviously. Oh, okay. Well, who was Jesus then? God's son. Therefore, was he obligated to pay the tax? Not as God's son. He was free from paying it. No different than what the rulers of that day were doing. The rulers didn't tax their family, and the one who imposed the tax did not tax his own family. The same concept, but notice what Jesus said here. Jesus says, you know, Peter, it seems like we got a problem. You know, and we don't want to offend anybody, so Peter, let's solve this problem. I want you to go fishing. Wouldn't it be great if all of our problems could be solved that way? You know, so Peter goes fishing. And he goes fishing and he is to then throw the line out. And the first fish that you catch, you'll find a coin in it. And it will then be a, the, a right amount of money for the tax for not only me, but also for you too, Peter. And that concludes the only verses that we have on this topic. Did this miracle eventually take place? Did Peter follow through and do all of this? I have no doubt that it did. But nevertheless, it's not recorded anywhere for us within God's inspired word. Wow, isn't that an amazing miracle? Now, you're probably sitting out there and saying, okay, this was cool. This is an interesting thing. But so what? It's just Jesus doing a miracle. I mean, how in the world... Is there anything here for me? Is there anything that I can take from this in order to help me within our Christ, in my life and my walk? And I would like to contend there are a lot of things there for us. So let us look at, the, at at least four items here of what God is teaching us and what we need to learn and to remember within our Christian life and walk. The first one is this. The Lord knows everything. The Lord knows everything. And we see that in verse 25. Now, if you can just picture the scene. Okay, the, the tax collectors ask Peter a question. Peter answers, yes, of course he's going to pay the temple tax. But then it's almost like Peter says, I better go and ask Jesus if that was the right answer. And in verse 25, he then comes in. And at the minute that he enters into the room, Jesus first says to Peter this question and asks him a question that is actually going to answer the question that Peter was going to ask even before Peter asked the question. He knew what was going on. 
Jesus then knew what Peter's question was. He knew what was in his mind and what was in his thoughts. He knew about the conversation that had taken place with the tax collectors. And therefore, he was ready to answer the question even before Peter arrived. And the moment that Peter arrived, he first then causes Peter to think by asking the question. He knows everything. Now, I know you know that. But yet, at the same time, do we live it? And do we understand it? Because I'd like to suggest to you that the fact that the Lord knows everything is a convicting and comforting truth. It should be a convicting truth because he knows everything about you. He knows everything you think. He knows everything that you do. He knows everything that is going on in your life. Even those things that you feel that no one knows about, just you. The secret sins that you coddle that you kind of keep close to yourself and, and seemingly like to do, but yet God knows. You might be fooling the people around you, your spouse, the people you come into contact with. You might be fooling all of them, but yet you are not fooling God. Your life is an open book before him. There is nothing that escapes his sight. Hebrews 4.13 says, no creature is not manifest in his sight. Everything is open before him. You might think you're fooling some people. You are never fooling God. You know, years ago, uh, our family, this is when we had kids in the house, we, we took a trip. We were down in Tennessee, and I just call this town a tourist trap. It's Gatlinburg, Tennessee. But we went down there, and uh, at that time was a place called Christus Gardens. And it was a place that kind of had uh, depictions of biblical scenes that you could go in and to see. And I don't think it is there anymore, quite honestly, but it was an interesting thing to go through at that time. But the most amazing thing in that entire setup and that entire attraction was when you began to exit the building, you would be in a courtyard before you would then leave the, the venue, and in that courtyard was a sculptured marble head of what Christ looked like. You know, it was a, the head of Christ, you know, at least what the sculptor thought he may have looked like. So it was probably about four feet tall. It was an amazing work of art, huge. I don't even, you know, just to get it there, I'm just like, yeah, that's a massive thing. But what was the most eerie thing about it, if you will, is that you would stand straight on and look at it. You would move to the side and look at it. You would be at a kind of a 90 degree angle and look at it. And it was almost like in a 180 degree arc as you would walk around this, this marble sculpture. It was done in a way so that no matter where you were at, the eyes were always looking at you. You could not escape the gaze of Christ looking right at you. I tell you, that's exactly what's happening now. He looks at us, he sees us, he knows everything about us. And the question is, what is you hiding that you think no one knows about? Guess what? It's open before God. It should be a very convicting truth. On the other hand, this should be a very comforting truth too. Because you know it's comforting because likewise we know that whatever we're going through, whatever we say or do, whatever struggles or issues of life that you're in, God knows about him, right? He's ready to help. He's ready to come to you through the sufferings and the difficulties and the trials of life. He stands by and is ready to come to your aid. He's ready to help. He's ready to assist. You know, there was a person at one time asked a lifeguard this question. The man asked the lifeguard and said this, How can you tell when anyone is in need of help when there's thousands of swimmers in water making all kinds of commotion and noise? And the lifeguard responded, no matter how great the noise and confusion, there's never been a single time when I could not distinguish the cry of distress above them all. I can always tell. And you know what? God knows what you're going through. He knows the issues. He knows the struggles. He knows the problems of life. He is ready there to come to your aid and to come to your assistance. He's ready to assist you in whatever those difficulties are. And when you cry out for help for him, he is ready to run to that cry and to assist and to give you comfort and encouragement that you need. Why can he do that? Because he knows everything. There's nothing that he is as outside of his knowledge or his control. So you see, he knows all. It should be convicting 
And at the same time, it should be comforting, a basic truth that we should never forget. Well, not only do we see here that God knows everything, but also it is here that he owns everything. Okay? And this you really can get from the, uh, the temple tax situation because ultimately it's God's temple, right? God's temple. And since Jesus and the Father are one, <laughs> we can also say that, yeah, he owns the temple too. You know, so it's not too, uh, too much of a stretch to say that he owns everything about it. He owns everything within our life. You know, we proudly proclaim 100% of everything we have is from God, right? He's given it all to us. He can take it away in a heartbeat, too, if, he's, if he so desires. Everything that we have is from him because he owns everything. We should not forget it. But yeah, let's take it a step further. We say that while we say that God owns everything, what about our own selves? Who owns us? And let's turn real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. An amazing verse, verse you should not forget, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20. First Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, where it says, What? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, do what? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His, not yours. Everything that you have comes from him and your very life that you have also comes from him your very existence comes from him and therefore since he owns that it is only right for us to be giving back to god what is due to him namely our lives in worship and service to him because he owns us i want you to look back at matthew chapter 22 because here we're going to find another situation that our lord found himself in and it's an interesting situation because it's dealing with another tax, believe it or not. So he's going to have to now answer another question about taxes. But yet, it's an interesting situation because it teaches us a very important concept of his ownership. Notice what it says in verse 15, Matthew 22, starting with verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. So immediately you see here, this is a setup, right? They're trying to trap him, all right? So they sent their disciples to, to him along with Herodians, and then they butter him up. Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the temple tax to Caesar or not? Now let's just stop there for a moment. Because here you have two parties, the Pharisees and the Herodians. These people hated each other, okay? But there's, this shows that they, how much more they hated Christ because now they teamed up together to try to get at Jesus. Now the Herodians were the political party of the day. They taught that you should pay taxes to the government. And if you didn't, you would be in trouble. Ah, but the Pharisees, by contrast, they taught that if you, that you should not pay taxes to a pagan king. And if you pay taxes to a pagan king, that is wrong, that is sin, you shouldn't be doing it. So the reason that these two parties then teamed up to ask Jesus a question is that regardless of, of what side they were on here, Jesus was in a very difficult situation, do you, do, don't you, do you see? Because if Jesus would have answered, yes, pay your taxes, the Pharisees would say, aha, we got you. You shouldn't be paying taxes to the pagan king, and therefore the Jewish people would reject him because of that situation and because of that belief structure. So if Jesus answered, no, don't pay your taxes, you know, you're going to have some problems, right? So say, yes, pay your taxes because the Jewish people are going to have a, have a problem with you. On the other hand, if Jesus would say, no, don't pay your taxes, the Pharisees would be happy and the Jewish people would be happy, but what the Herodians do? Treason. You're rebelling against Rome. Therefore, you're in trouble. So here's Jesus is in a situation. If he answers yes, it's a problem. If he answers no, it's a problem. So what's Jesus going to do? We then see in verse 19, Jesus knew their evil intent. Again, he knows all, right? He knew what was going on. You're hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? 
Show me the coin that is used for paying the tax. They brought to him a denarius, and he asked him, Whose image is this, and whose inscriptions? Caesar, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Now, did you notice the last verse there? Both parties thought they had him in a trap. But yet Jesus' answer caused them to be speechless, and they just left. So the answer that Jesus gave satisfied both parties. On the one hand, it's very easy to see. He held up a coin, stamped with Caesar's image, give to Caesar what is Caesar, and what to, and to, give to Caesar what's Caesar, and to God what's God's. Give to Caesar what's Caesar, pay your taxes. So yes, our Lord affirms you should pay your taxes. Give to Caesar. The Herodians were very happy. The answer was correct. But yet, why did the Pharisees leave? Why is it that they were happy with this when it says, give to God what's God's? Well, let me ask you this. What has God given to you? You know, if I were to tell you to take your two fingers and put it on your wrist, you should feel a pulse. If you do not, call 911, okay? You should feel a pulse. If you have a pulse, that means what? You are alive. God has given you life. Now, let me ask you this. When God created us, how did he make us? He stamped us with his image. <laughs> Since God has given us life and stamped us with his image, we are to give back to God what is due to him, our lives, in worship and service of the king, because he owns us, he created us. And that's why the Pharisees could say nothing, because they understood the implications of what Jesus was giving. Just as the government is given a coin, stamp the money with its image, give back to government what is due. And since God has created you and given you life and stamped you with your image, give him back what is due to him, your life in worship and service. God owns all things. Turning back to Matthew chapter 17, we're now going to see that not only does God own all things and that he knows all things, but also the Lord controls all things. And I think you can easily see that here within this text. Now, you know, if we're honest, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, all of us like power. I mean, power is good to have. You know, and I've done many things in my life. I've been a bus driver. I've been a referee, official in sports. Being a bus driver, it's awesome. I mean, do you realize that the flick of a switch, I can bring four lanes of traffic to a standstill? Whether I have someone to pick up or, any, or not is irrelevant. The red lights go on, everybody stops. Oh, that's power. You know, I, I, and when I officiated ball games, if I didn't like the coach and the ball game was never going to be won by them anyway, it's amazing how big the strike zone got. Get the game over with. I'm going to go home. <laughs> you know, you have power. You know, in my car, I have power windows and power locks. I'd love to tease my wife with it. If it's freezing cold out, put her window down. <laughs> then she hits me. <laughs> you know, but, you know, but in all of those things, you know, we like power, don't we? It's, it's fun to have, but all of us, and in my illustrations, all of us can misuse the power. God never misuses his power. Now, here we can see the power uh, that is demonstrated by God here in this miracle. Now, Jesus could have created the money on the spot, right? He could have reached into his pocket, well, whatever they had robes in that day, and pulled it out. Wouldn't have been a problem, but he chose not to do that. He tells Peter to go fishing. Now, let me ask you some questions that shows the power of God here. Where Peter went fishing, how many fish were in the lake? There were quite a bit, okay? Now, of all those fish that were in the lake, how many of them had a coin in its mouth? All right. Now, now, we've narrowed it down significantly, right? Now, all those fish that supposedly would have a coin in its mouth, how many of them had the exact coin that would pay the temple tax for two people? Okay. And out of all of those fish that had the exact coin, how many of them would have been swimming at the very place that Peter went fishing? And how many of those would have bit the hook when Peter threw it in. Now, if it was me, none of them would have bit the hook. It's the way it goes. How many of them would have bit the hook? 
And then out of all of those that would bit the hook, now what they tell me is when the fish bites the hook, they kind of struggle, right, to reel it in. How many of them could have been reeled in and not have thrown the coin out of its mouth in a struggle to not get caught? I mean, are you seeing the implication here? This is infinite and minute control of everything. Jesus has that power to do that. And he therefore has the power to help us within our lives. Things that you might think are insurmountable, impossible circumstances are all things that he can easily handle and in control of as he works them out for his divine plan. You might think things in our country, in our state, are just totally out of whack, out of control. No, God's in charge. It's in control. It's well within his power uh, in order to deal with the issue at hand. You know, there was a story told, and uh, it's a story about Moses, Jesus, and the just an old, old gray-haired, bearded guy that went golfing. And it was an amazing threesome. And they came up to a par three. Par three is about 200 yards. There's a lake that's protecting the green, sand traps on each side. Moses gets up and hits the ball. And it's a line drive coming up short. But it's a line drive just barely off the ground. and starts rolling down the fairway going right for that pond that's protecting the green. And what Moses does, he holds his club up in the air. The waters part. The ball rolls through on dry ground and is on the green. It was an amazing shot. Then you have Jesus that gets up. So he hits the ball, and it's a beautiful looking shot, high up in the air, just like you're supposed to. Ball gets up there, and it's, but it's going to be short. It's going right for that water trap. Again, that pond to come into play. The ball is going down, and before it can splash, the ball just stops, hovers above the water. Jesus calmly walks down, walks in the water, chips it up on the green. Now remember, Jesus is lying two, Moses is lying one, so this is pretty good at this point. Then this third man, the third person in the party, this gray-haired, scraggly guy gets up. He just kind of randomly whacks at the ball. The ball careens off to the right. Just a terrible hit. Careens off to the right. Hits a tree flush. Careens off the tree, goes across the fairway, hits a rock, goes over the fence, out of bounds, onto a nearby road. A truck hits the ball. The ball goes up on the roof of a nearby complex. And the ball then rattles around the roof, goes down in the gutters, and then into the downspout, and somehow shoots across the downspout at a great rate of speed, going back across the road, hitting another uh, rock, let's say, and goes high up in the air over the fence and is heading for this pond. And the ball drops right on a lily pad on this pond. The minute it hits a lily pad, a bullfrog jumps up and grabs the ball in its mouth. The minute the ball gets in his mouth, an eagle swoops down, grabs the frog, carries him off for dinner. The fr they fly over the green. The bullfrog burps, if you will, in delight. The ball falls out of his mouth, lands on the green. Can you believe it? It's going right for the hole. It hits the flag. Boom. Hole in one. Moses looks up to Jesus and says, I hate playing golf with your dad. Now, no disrespect at all to the gray-haired guy being God in this case, okay? The point is, while you think that something like that could never happen, do you realize that in a mere afterthought in God's mind, that if he wanted that exact thing to occur, it would easily and quickly come to pass because he knows and controls everything. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Job verses 36, verse 32. <clears throat> and you have to have the NIV that I think translates it, I think, uh, correctly in this area. But nevertheless, Job 36, verse 32 says, he fills his hand with lightning and he commands it to strike its mark. God holds lightning in his hand and commands it to strike its mark. Do you realize that even the bolts of lightning are controlled by God? And they hit where he has determined. You know, when I was in, I think it was in high school, coming back from visiting my dad's mom, my grandmother, it was an overclass, overcast day, came to a railroad crossing, and I just so happened to be looking down the railroad tracks a bolt of lightning came out of nowhere, hit the transformer that was on a telephone pole, and snapped that thing like a toothpick. 
it was awesome. I mean, I think if dad almost wrecked the cars, I screamed. But it was amazing. I mean, I've never forgotten. It's indelibly imprinted on my mind. That was God's mark. I just so happened to be looking and to see that the massive amount of power where a telephone pole is rendered to nothing in a matter of a split second was just unbelievable. Another golfer, name of Lee Trevino, now 82 years old, still around. He was asked once, he said, you know, Lee, it's lightning out. You know, things aren't good in the golf course. What, what are you supposed to do? You know, there's lightning. What do you, what's, what's, what's the best thing to do? And Lee Trevino gave an interesting answer. He said, well, in order to be totally safe, what you should do, you take your one iron out of your golf bag and you just go around and just keep waving it up in the air just like this. That's the safest place to be. Just do that. And, and, and the, the reporter says, Lee, you're crazy. Why would you want to do that? There's lightning around. He says, yeah, there is. But even God can't hit a one iron. Now, if you're a golfer, you understand that. <laughs> one irons are tough to hit. But Lee, you better hope that's not God's mark. Because I guarantee you, he will have no problem hitting it at all. Because God controls everything. The last thing that we're going to see here and talk about this morning is that he serves all. Did you notice what it said? Even though Jesus was not obligated at all to pay the temple tax, he said, but so that we may not cause offense, we're going to go ahead and pay it anyway. Now here it's interesting that that word for offend or offense is the word where we get our word stumbling block from. It's a snare, it's a trap, if you will. Um, and a stumbling block, by the way, is just not an emotional idea, you're going to make me feel bad, okay? This is literally something that's going to cause somebody to fall away from the faith, to cause a massive hindrance within their life and within their walk for the Lord. And if Jesus would not have paid this temple tax, even though he didn't have to, then he would have had a very serious impact on the ministry to the Jewish people who he would be then demonstrating that the temple's not important. But yet it was within the Jewish life and culture. So even though he was not required to pay this at all, he went ahead and did it anyway in order for him to have this ministry and to continue with it with the Jewish people. Now you know there's many things in our life that comes into play. We're called to serve. And sometimes that might mean doing things that we don't feel we really need to do or staying away from things that we likewise really don't really need to do. But yet, because our ministry to others is so important and to help them grow within their Christian life and walk, we freely and willingly abstain from those things in order for us to continue to have that ministry within their heart and within their life. So we have to be very careful in how we live and when we act and interrelate with other believers because our hearts should be one of a servant. Hearts should be one that we want to be engaged with them. We want to be involved within their life. And if we have to give up things that really is not a problem for us to do one way or the other, it's a gray area in Scripture, hey, it's really not too much to ask. It's not a big deal. And therefore, you just willingly do that in order to have the ministry that you need to have and what God wants you to do within their life and within their walk. So you see, in this miracle, there's four verses, but yet there's a lot of information here. So as you look at your life, as you look at your walk before the Lord, tell me, where are you at? I mean, are there things that you need to change, you need to adjust? As you know that God is looking at you and there are things that you need to make corrections on, go a better path, go the right way, obedience to God and to his will. And therefore, give up what those things are that might be holding you back because he knows what you're going through. He also understands where you're at in your life and walk. He has the power to help you and the power to assist with whatever those needs are. This miracle teaches us all of those things. And I think that if we look at our Christian life and walk, don't forget the fundamentals. Those are where we go astray. That's where we really blow it. It's not because of those in-depth things that we try to study on, but rather... Christianity 101, if you will, the basics. Don't ever forget them. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for your text that tells us so many things, tells us so many things about how we should live and how we should walk. And Lord, I know that in, in areas of my life, there's, you know, it's always one of improvement and always one of growth. 
Uh, as I progress in life, I see more things that I need to work on. And yet, Lord, I know that uh, it's only by your grace and by your help that you can assist in all of these things. Lord, with all the struggles and issues of life that you go through, whether they be issues at work, relationships, medical issues, whatever they may be, Lord, we know that you're in control, that you're sovereign, that you're in charge of all these things, and God, that they're all working them out in accordance with your plan. And, and really what we need to do is to be dependent on you, dependent upon what you can do and what you're going to accomplish. And Father, just help us to be dependent children, ones that trust and rely on you, and that will, as a result, then worship you even more, glorify you in the way that we live, and just help us to bring honor and glory to you in our life and living. We thank you, Lord, and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.